Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Mary Ann Yeager and CEO of the Sequoia Project, and really delighted that you're joining us today for a deeper dive into the Common Agreement and Standard Operating Procedures. So joining me today is Steve Gravely. Uh, he's a lead, uh, founder and CEO of Gravely Group and has been on point as lead for the legal work that we've been doing here in developing the Common Agreement and Standard Operating Procedures. I also have Chantal Warzola, who's been leading our stakeholder outreach. And also on the phone is uh, with us and, and on the meeting here today is Alan Swenson. He's the executive director from Carry Quality. He and his team are gonna be operationalizing this and working with QHINs through the process. So the work that we are doing here today is part of our cooperative agreement agreement with the ONC uh, and our role as a recognized coordinating entity to help them implement TEFCA. And what we're presenting here today is not an official position of the, of the government, but a byproduct of our work on this project. So what we're going to cover today is we want to provide a little bit of background in terms of how exchange is anticipated to work under TEFCA the components of TEFCA and exchange purposes that are contemplated. And that's really to set the tone uh, for those of you who may not have dialed in before now. Um, but really the purpose today is to delve into the details of the common agreement, which we have version one and well, as well as the standard operating procedures. And then we'll wrap it up today. This is intended to be, you know, really an opportunity for you to have your questions addressed. So please type those into the uh, chat function or the question function as you go, you raise your hand, we can unmute your line and address questions as well. If you aren't really clear about how TEFCA works or how what it might mean to you and you're really new to this, we really encourage you to actually listen to the overview webinar that we hosted on January 18th. Um, the topics today are really more geared toward those organizations that may seek to participate in TEFCA as a qualified health information network. And so there might be a lot of detail here that may or may not be of interest to those who may want to be a participant in a QHIN, a qualified health information network. So just want to mention there are other, you know, higher level forums available for that. So uh, why don't we go ahead and jump in and give a little bit of background on how exchange is anticipated to work under TEFCA. So ONC has really been tasked by Congress through the 21st Century Cures Act to develop or support a trusted exchange framework and common agreement. In that regard, ONC really sets the tone and direction in terms of the overall policy requirements and governance, and there are just some inherently governmental functions that they can't delegate, but really a lot of the work that we have been doing with ONC is in our role as the private sector recognized coordinating entity. So we've been working with ONC to develop um, the first version of the common agreement, the standard operating procedures, <clears throat> pardon me, and on the QHEN technical framework. So our role is really more of coordinating, providing oversight, and providing for a governance approach for QHENs. But the lion's share of what's spelled out under TEFCA, really the expectations of how networks that wanna seek special designated status to be qualified, so qualified health information networks or QHINs, and how they interconnect with each other to facilitate nationwide interoperability. And the goal here is to make it simpler so the participants in one QHIN can share information with participants and the sub-participants in another QHIN without necessarily having to participate in multiple networks. And the idea is that it makes it easier to share information, that there's a common floor for policy and technical requirements to support that, and really, um, delegating a lot of um, the specifics in terms of technically how it works between a QHIN and its participants sort of further downstream. That's, you know, if you want more details on technically how this works, we have several webinars that get into more detail on the QHIN technical framework. And then the idea here is that each QHIN represents a set of participants and who may in, of, in and of themselves also connect others. So an example of that would be a QHIN, uh, it's maybe a national network, it's participants, or maybe healthcare provider organizations, or maybe health plans, <clears throat> maybe HIEs, or maybe more of the more, more, one of those, and that they in, them, in and of themselves represent subsequent connectivity. And there's also the role of an individual in this in terms of being having the ability to use their platform of choice or service provider, and that would be their platform that they use to access their own records. So that's how exchange is anticipated to work under TEFCA. So the role of a QHIN um, is really intended to serve as a national node uh, and that in, it's interconnecting with, with other networks of comparable size, volume, and uh, resilience and security. So think of these, these are sort of the super nodes in the um, nationwide health information highway. So QHINs are going to process tons of transactions, tens of millions of transactions a day because they're routing transactions to their participants 
and sub-participants from, you know, really inquiries or queries or receiving messages from other, other QHINs. So in that respect, QHINs are expected to be very reliable, um, sophisticated, well-resourced, and they have the ability to support a high degree of security. They're expected to comply with the common agreement, which points to the QHIN technical requirements and then other standard operating procedures. Participants and participants basically can choose whichever QHIN in which they want to participate um, based on the services provided and whatever fees that QHIN might charge their organization. And so the idea here is that participants or sub-participants can use their QHIN of choice to share information with everyone else that is connected through QHIN to QHIN exchange, regardless of which QHIN in which they participate. There is an expectation here that QHINs in and of it themselves may not charge fees to other QHINs for any exchange under the common agreement. However, QHINs may, and we expect probably will, charge fees to the participants that connect through their network. In terms of other terminology, I again mentioned that the individual is a very important part of our uh, TEFCA interconnected networks here. Um, and so again, an individual can use whatever application of choice, which we call an individual access service provider, um, and they use that as their vehicle for accessing their own information. So that's a little bit about the role of a QHIN. So examples of QHIN's participants and sub-participants is really multi-purpose, multi-faceted, and really intended to cover quite broad reach of the types of organizations that participate in health information exchange today. So this could be healthcare provider organizations. Healthcare provider organizations are not intended to be QHINs um, unless they really have a, a line of business that they want to serve as a national node. We're anticipating that most healthcare organizations are going to connect through a QHIN. Health information exchanges are another example of a type of participant that may connect to a QHIN. We've heard of some HIEs, particularly those that might support multiple states, may have an interest in serving as a QHIN, but really an organization that services a particular regional or statewide market is really not what was intended to be a national node. Not saying that an HIE that has all these capacities to do so couldn't be a QHIN, but really not intended because again, the expectations of what a QHIN um, has to operate is really a national level exchange scale. And again, tens of millions of transactions a day, you know, and not having an ability to really charge other QHINs fees. Other examples could be health, electronic health records uh, um, vendors themselves or health systems, pharmacies, and again, consumer apps connecting through. And there could be multiple levels here, as you can see, um, in terms of how folks connect. This is an example of a QHIN that might have a multitude of different uh, types of players. This is just an easy example to show the diversity of the types of connectivity QHINs may support. It's possible that some QHINs might only connect providers. Some QHINs might only connect HIEs, or some QHINs may only connect health plans, which are not reflected here, but again, participant, or it might connect public health, not reflected on this particular slide, but definitely contemplated. And we get into the exchange purposes that will be evident. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chantal. We'll talk a little bit briefly about the components of TEFCA, what we're going to drill down on today, and I think into the exchange purposes. So I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Marianne. And in the interest of getting to the, the heart of the matter quickly, um, these are the various pieces that work together to create uh, the framework for TEFCA to operate, and my apologies, my camera seems to be uh, a little wonky. I might just turn it off. Um, I'm assuming folks can hear me, but the pieces that come together to make uh, TEFCA work include the Trusted Exchange Framework, which was actually uh, published in the Federal Register by ONC, the Common Agreement, which is on the RCE website, standing operating procedures, which will be really uh, explained today in some detail, the QTF, which was uh, outlined in a webinar yesterday, then the actual process of QHINs applying and being designated and being onboarded, and then tracking progress through metrics and governing all of this through a, an inclusive governing approach. Approach and some of the SOPs speak to that governing approach. So Steve will be covering those 
later today. So on the next slide, the common agreement I think you all know is this legal document signed by the RCE and the QHINs themselves. There are pieces of the common agreement that flow down to other entities through the agreements that each QHIN signs with its participants, participants sign with sub-participants, and it is a, an overarching framework and incorporates things like the QTF and the standard operating procedures by reference. On the next slide. These are the standard operating procedures that have been released to date. There will be more over time, and you'll get a fair amount of detail on those later in the webinar. And so just want to help folks understand the flow downs because this network of networks, this nationwide exchange, this single set of trust um, framework really only works if all participants are held to the same single set of rules. And that is the purpose of the flow down provisions. There are pieces of the common agreement that are only applicable to things that QHINs do, but there are pieces of it that need to flow down to other participants. There are also pieces of the QTF uh, that flow down to participants. And so you can see the areas here. Anyone who wants to look at the very specific language of the flow downs, it is noted in the common agreement very clearly, which, um, sections of the common agreement will be subject to flow down and we do intend to provide additional uh, educational materials and and information just to help those who who don't feel comfortable going to the common agreement and looking through the full legal text to find uh, these flow down provisions all right Moving on then to the exchange purposes under TEFPA, there are six, uh, and these are the six exchange purposes authorized under the common agreement, treatment, payment, healthcare operations. Then we have public health, government benefits determination, and then the all important individual access services to allow an individual to be able to gather their data from across multiple sources into a single view or a single place. Uh, and so some of the things that are important to note here is that we do have a forthcoming SOP that will specify that treatment and individual access services require responses from the beginning. Eventually, the other four exchange purposes will also require responses uh, in conformance with forthcoming implementation guides. So we heard from stakeholders that there was concern about having all of this go live all at once, right from the beginning. And so this is a staged approach, uh, starting with things that are really quite well known, treatment and individual access services, and building out from there. Um, and so with that, let's go to the next slide. Uh, here, this is just a little more, a little bit more detail on what do these exchange purposes mean. Uh, treatment, payment, and healthcare operations really have the same meaning as they do under the HIPAA privacy rule. We have the public health exchange purposes that are really about uh, requests for uses and disclosures of information by public health authorities consistent with the HIPAA privacy rule and other applicable law. Remember, everything here is within the umbrella of applicable law, um, including at the state and local level, which we know is important uh, for our public health sector. Government benefits determination is really about the VA or another governmental body seeking information in order to determine whether or not an individual does in fact meet the requirements uh, for a certain benefit category. And then we have the individual access services. So that's just a quick review 
um, of what all was put out on January 18th. And so I'm going to turn it over to Steve and uh, let him start that deeper dive. Thank you, Chantal. I really appreciate that. Um, let me turn on my camera. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm Steve Gravely with Gravely Group. I have the privilege of providing legal support to the RCE uh, on this project. So we wanted to do a pretty quick tour um, over the next 10 slides or so of the common agreement. And then we'll pause and then we'll transition into three of the SOPs. Um, so here is just a screenshot of the table of contents. As you can see, it's very comprehensive. And if you've read it, you already know that. Um, so we're going to dive into a few of these today. So next slide, please. All right. Apparently, Chantal's not the only one whose camera is a bit wonky. My apologies. Um, all right. So let's let's start kind of at the beginning. How does an organization uh, become a human? And um, and so that gets us into the idea of eligibility criteria, um, and then the onboarding and the designation process. So in the common agreement. Um, we identify um, several eligibility criteria, and we'll unpack those here in the next couple of slides. But basically, these eligibility criteria are, are aimed at assuring that prospective QHANs have the ability to perform the functions that um, a QHAN is going to have to perform in order to support the exchange of information through electronic transactions. And they'll have to do that for the exchange purposes that Chantal just talked about. And they'll have to do that in the manner prescribed in the QHIN technical framework or the QTF. And so it's important that um, a, a prospective human be able to demonstrate to the RC that it has the ability to do that successfully. And that's more really than just server capacity. Um, that really, um, it really speaks to the entire organization uh, of the organization seeking to be a human. So the eligibility criteria talk about what is the legal structure um, uh, of the human. What, what type of it is it a corporation? Is it a partnership? Is it an LLC? Um, more importantly, it, is it in good standing um, in whatever uh, jurisdiction it's organized? And whether it's Delaware, New York, Virginia, Texas, doesn't really matter, but is it in good standing? Um, we also, um, the eligibility criteria talk about what type of governing model does the prospective QHIN use? How does it govern its organization and its data exchange network? And that's important for the RC to understand because um, the RC, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, has its own governing model. And there are certain core values that the RC wants to be sure QHINs have in place um around governance is it representative is it fair is it transparent is it accountable you know, basic fundamental principles of governance that are accepted as best practices and therefore the Q, the rce needs to know how do you approach governance in your organization and is that compatible with what we expect of a qhan and then third thirdly at a very high level does the prospective QHIN have the resources and the infrastructure that the RC believes is going to be required to support a reliable, trusted network? And not only do you have it, but can you demonstrate to the RC 
that you that you have it. <clears throat> now, humans, once they are designated, um, that's really the beginning of the beginning, if you will, because humans will be expected to provide a variety of reporting to the RCE on an ongoing basis on various metrics related to the operation of the Hughens uh, network. And the RC will monitor that. Um, and, and so, it, you know, obviously everyone right now is probably focused on the common agreement, the SOPs, um, how do I become, a, can I be a human? How do I become a human? When will I be designated? And, and, that's, and that's fine. But let's all remember that that really is the beginning of the beginning, because once designated, then you are um, responsible for um, operating your network at a very high level in order to support exchange. Now, the RC understands that this is a lot to digest, and therefore uh, the RC is committed to conducting education like this. Uh, for large groups, and also um, smaller group or perhaps even individual uh, sessions with prospective applicants, so that they understand um, what's expected of them, what the process will be like. I do want to point out that only the RCE can designate a human, no one else. Um, and ONC has delegated to the Sequoia Project under the cooperative agreement, the responsibility for implementing TEFCA. And part of that is the role that the RCE has in designated humans. Next slide. Up oh, the other way. Thank you. All right, so now we're gonna dive into another really important concept and that's a concept of uh, cooperation and non-discrimination. So the common agreement sets out some very clear expectations for QHENS, but also for the participants and sub-participants of those QHENS. If you think back to the chart that Marianne walked through with the umbrella, um, you know, give QHENS up under the umbrella, but then all of those QHENs have participants, their customers, and many of those participants will have sub-participants. Um, and that's really the universe when we think about uh, TEFCA. So, um, so the common agreement reflects the fact that this is a complicated ecosystem and it really does depend upon everyone cooperating with each other. So well, what does that look like? Well, the, it looks like uh, these four bullet points that every QHEN and their participants and their sub-participants are contractually bound to respond in a timely manner to inquiries from others in the ecosystem, other QHENs, other participants, other sub-participants. In other words, when, when you send an email to um, another Hughen about a concern you have or a question you have, or you're trying to debug something or figure out whether there's even a problem, you should expect a timely response. And the same happens when you receive a request. You are required to provide a timely response. And that sounds basic, I know. But we know in, in today's world, everybody's very busy. And, you know, my question is not always a priority for the person that receives my question. So what we're saying here, as a matter of contract, there's an expectation that um, you will um, respond in a timely manner. We don't have a certain number of days. We feel like people are more mature than that. But you'll timely respond. Uh, to where inquiries that you receive. On the other side, every QHEN and participant and sub-participant has an affirmative obligation to notify others when they are experiencing persistent 
and widespread connectivity failures. And we know this happens. Um, it doesn't happen because someone has uh, failed or messed up. It just happens. And But it's important that we tell others in our community that it is happening so that folks can adapt and take whatever um, actions they feel like they need to take. Now, when the in inevitable things happen, um, the common agreement sets as a standard of conduct that everyone will help everyone else in resolving these issues. Um, because often connectivity issues or other issues are not isolated to a single organization or a single network. Often they are um, they they are complicated and span across um, many different organizations or networks, and therefore um, it's important that everyone in Tefka make a priority of helping each other out, so that we can get back online as rapidly as possible. And then uh, last but certainly not least. Uh, the, the common agreement requires every QN and their participant and their sub-participant to be open to sharing information about their cybersecurity risks. I know this is a sensitive topic. No one wants to talk about their cybersecurity vulnerability, and, and we understand that. However, it is critical that there be a degree of transparency among TEFCA so that um, as a community, we can mature and harden and move forward. There will be a cybersecurity council that will be created at the RC level that QHINs will participate in. And that's probably the body that will put meat on the bones of, of what the sharing looks like. So that's the cooperation side. What about the non-discrimination side? Non-discrimination is not a new concept. It's one that um, Care Quality, for example, memorialized in its common in its uh, Care Quality Connected Agreement over seven years ago, and many other networks have done that as well. And non-discrimination has certainly been prominently addressed in uh, ONC's information blocking final rule. So the common agreement builds upon that and says that QHINs, participants, and sub-participants are prohibited from limiting interoperability with other QHINs, participants, or sub-participants in a discriminatory manner. And of course, what is a discriminatory manner? I mean, that, that's what's important here. And so the common agreement talks about discriminatory manner would include treating similarly situated uh, exchange partners differently. So um, acting, you know, prohibiting interoperability because another QHIN is a competitor or perceived as a competitor or at the participant or sub-participant level, uh, restricting interoperability between competing health systems or competing providers of another category. All this is addressed in information blocking, right? Um, but I don't want to confuse anyone. Uh, I, I may refer to that as a example. Um, but um, I am not, you know, I'm not, I'm not conflating information blocking and tech. They are separate. However, the we address some concepts in in the common agreement, and so discrimination would include this type of behavior, uh, and that's prohibited under the common agreement. Next slide. I do know that 
some of the Sequoia folks have had a little bit of trouble with their laptops. And so I'm not sure we're just going to have to pause for a moment and until uh, we can advance the slide. Yep, just one moment, Steve. Uh, Marianne was knocked off and I am taking over. No problem, Don. Thank you. Oh, no, sorry. You have to look at the big screen of me. Let's not make them do that too long. Um, okay. All right. All right. Next slide. All right. Whoa. Nope. Nope. Back up a little bit. Okay. Back up. Back up. All right. Now, advance one. Advance one. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So now let's talk about request uses and disclosures of information. And um, there's a lot here to unpack. So TEFCA requests, um, in other words, when um, when a participant or sub-participant of QNA wants information um, and they they think that a participant or sub-participant of QNB you know, may have it, or they don't even know. But the way this works is that the sub-participant or the participant will route their request via a QN to QN exchange um, using the process and protocols established in the QTF. And they'll do that in a way that's consistent with the requirements of the common agreement. Now, you already heard Marianne talk and Chantal talk about exchange purposes. And so there are a finite number of exchange purposes that are that QHINs are required to support. Right now, the only treatment and individual access services um, will be exchange purposes for which a response is required. However, over time, probably sooner and not later, the uh, responding to other exchange purposes with information will also be required. And, um, and QNs will have to support all exchange purposes from day one. And when I say support, they'll have to have the ability to tran transact the request or transact the response if someone in their stack wants to respond, even though they're not required to. And so, um, and so today we we start with treatment and we start with individual access services. We will expand that, I think, somewhat quickly, but who knows. And so and so there are limitations in the common agreement around um, who can request information for treatment. And basically, um, a request for treatment information must originate from someone or some organization that is engaged in treatment. So a provider um, and, and someone who has a treatment relationship and who is licensed or certified or permitted uh, to have that treatment relationship. That won't be a QHIN. Obviously, this would originate uh, downstream of the QHIN um, in most cases at a participant or at a sub-participant. But but that is a requirement to initiate a request for TEFCA information um, under for the treatment exchange purpose, and then that would then go up through um, your shoehorn, be transmitted to all the other shoehorns, however many there are, and then um, because it's treatment, a response is required 
So all other participants or sub participants on down the line that have information responsive to the request are required to provide that unless providing it would be prohibited by applicable law. Um, and so that's the way requests work. Now, what about uses and disclosures? So let's let's assume that a request is run out for treatment uh, from an organization or individual that's appropriately uh, authorized to to submit that request, and then technical information is sent back in response to the request, and it flows back through the shoe hen down to the participant, down to the sub-participant. Perhaps there are multiple layers of sub-participants. Eventually, it reaches its destination. And um, the destination being the organization um, or individual, but most, most likely the organization that initiated it. Okay, at that point then, let's assume that the recipient who was also the original requester. The recipient um, incorporates that information into their system of records, their EMR or something else. We say system of records to be as broad as possible. So they, they receive it, they absorb it into their system of record. At that point, um, that recipient is permitted under the common agreement to use and disclose that information that they received um, in accordance with applicable law, whatever law governs that recipient's um, use and disclosure of electronic protected health information. And so, and, and that's, a, that's a rational endpoint because at least for now, technology does not support the tagging of information by um, its it, where it came from. Um, perhaps in the future, that will be commonplace. We can debate the merits of whether that's desirable or not, but today it's not really feasible. Um, um, and so once you, once you consume information, it's it's part of your uh, record set, and therefore you you have to protect it just the way you would other information in your record set, and that may that would include privacy, security, and very possibly other requirements depending upon the nature of the information. Um, and we're using use and disclosure here the way HIPAA uses them, use being internal disclosure being external. Okay, next slide. Now, responses. So, the, the common agreement talks about this in section 9.4.1, but I want to headline, there will be an upcoming SOP um, that will expand upon what's in the common agreement. And it will, you know, memorialize the fact that exchange and IAS are, are the first exchange purposes, but, you know, we're trying to, to, to let you know that now. Um, now, there is, you know, when we say that a response will be required for treatment and for individual access services. We say that with a but, because as an, you know, no one's gonna be required to violate applicable law. Um, and it's very, it's, it's certainly possible that um, a, a QN or a participant or a sub-participant will be subject to local, state, federal, tribal, um, or other law that will prevent them 
from providing the information requested. Um, and I'm sure that you all can instantly think of examples where, where that would happen. And therefore, um, your, the common agreement does not require you to violate applicable law. And so, um, and so I want to put everyone's mind at ease. When we say you're required to respond with the information, that's always subject to um, you complying with your applicable law. Now, then beyond that, um, in section 9.4.1, there are some exceptions to required responses. And um, for, for public health authorities who are users of government benefits determination, that is an exchange purpose. Um, for example, uh, disability benefits or benefits from other uh, other state, local state, federal, tribal um, agencies, and so users of those of those programs and federal agencies, um, to the extent that they're prohibited from providing the requested information under applicable law, those three are exempted from being required to respond to requests. Now, for the federal agencies, that that's not really different than everyone else, applicable law. Although we know that the federal agencies are subject to a pretty broad variety of applicable law that the private sector doesn't have to deal with so that the scope of applicable law is broader the concepts the same the first two are uh, qualitatively different public health is not required to respond uh, to requests for uh, supported exchange purposes and part of that is because Public health um, has its own set of laws and regulations and executive orders and other state level things that restrict its ability to share information. Plus the fact that public health at the moment is very involved in fighting the pandemic. And therefore, from a resource allocation perspective, um, we wanted to. Um, not overburden public health. Um, so let's go to the next slide. All right. So I've given you, no, let's back up, please. I've given you a very, very rapid, high level overview of some of the key concepts uh, in the common agreement. I want to pause now for a moment. Uh, I'm about to move on to unpacking some of the SOPs. I'd love to pause, though, and see if we have any questions that uh, Marianne or Dawn feel like are uh, pressing. Hi, this is Marianne, and apologies. I think I got uh, had a little snafu with uh, my, my laptop. It actually blue screened right in the middle of that. There have been a couple questions. It, it just seems like there's some confusion in terms of how the exchange purposes under TEFCA relate to HIPAA. So for instance, the exchange purposes put forth the purpose of the transaction, the purpose for requesting the information, which includes you know, the requester, the purpose, if it's for treatment, the, you know, maybe the re requester has a treatment relationship with the individual, et cetera. And, and contrast that to what the rights are under HIPAA. Um, I, I think the exchange purposes are defined the same in, as under HIPAA. So to the extent that, and, and actually someone else asked if the exchange purposes SOP would delineate who can query for treatment, that kind of thing. I will mention separately that there will be an exchange purposes SOP that talks about 
additional parameters constraints around treatment and uh, individual access services, which we think pretty simply is going to say, hey, you have to respond to those requests if you have information about that person. Um, there will be other exchange purposes that are further delineated around payment and healthcare operations. We heard that there was some concern about how broad those purposes are, that maybe we might need to constrain it a bit further to make clear, you know, examples of types of healthcare operations and payment purposes and who the actors are involved in each. There's going to be a separate SOP that defines participants and sub-participants to kind of make more clear, you know, in a, uh, it, they're just certain by the definition of, of HIP, the HIPAA definition itself limits who can make, you know, can be a party to a healthcare operations and all that. But Steve, can you kind of build that out, sort of the, how the, HIPAA definition of treatment payment and healthcare operations relates to the exchange purposes. And we've tried addressing this question a couple of times and I'm not connecting the dots here. No, oh, yeah, it's fine. So, it's, so, um, so HIPAA obviously um, regulates protected health information. Um, and almost now it's, it's really EPHI. HIPAA regulates that. They, they actually regulate the covered entities and business associates that um, hold EPHI, uh, to be absolutely technically correct. And so HIPAA governs, the HIPAA privacy rule and security rule and the breach notification rule uh, govern entities. And um, if you're a covered entity or if you're a business associate of a covered entity, then you have obligations under um, HIPAA uh, with respect to how you use and disclose PHI, right? Um, and so the, when you think about HIPAA, you really need to think about it as um, targeting the, the, or the, 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 um, the covered entity and the business associate and their activities with respect to use and disclosure of information that they either have or they obtain. Um, TESCRA is all about enabling interoperability. So, so TEFRIA is, is focused on the um, technical standards in the QTF and the policy decisions that ONC has made about how a network should operate to achieve nationwide interoperability. There is overlap, of course, because the information that is being exchanged is health information. Uh, the common agreement calls it TEFCA information because it is information that is transacted via the connectivity services that exist within the TEFCA ecosystem, the umbrella graphic that Marianne shared. Um, However, it's still health information. It's still that information um, is protected um, by HIPAA, but only to the extent that there are covered entities or business associates involved. So what we've done with the common agreement is we have said, if you are a QHIN, um, and, or a participant, or a sub-participant, or a sub-sub-sub-sub-sub-participant. It's a slinky. That's the way I think about it. The human is up here where my hand is, and then gravity pulls it to the floor. I really need to bring a slinky, but I keep forgetting. And, and then there are participants, and then there are sub-participants. Well, some of those will be HIPAA-covered entities and they will already be subject to HIPAA. However, many of the QNs and participants and sub-participants probably will not be covered entities. And they may not be uh, business associates uh, of covered entities. And therefore today they are not subject to HIPAA. However, the common agreement says you will comply with the HIPAA privacy rules and uh, um, as if you were a covered entity or business associate, and we actually specify which of those you are required to comply with. 
So in that sense, the common agreement raises the bar. And so that's the way to think about how HIPAA and the common agreement interact. And maybe now with that explanation, um, when you go back and read those portions of the common agreement, as well as the SOPs, maybe it will help you better understand it. And I imagine we'll have some dedicated sessions around this going forward. Thanks, Steve. We um, have had a couple questions about security certifications, so I know other folks may raise it. I'll just address this one really quickly. The question was whether um, th there was note that, and this is jumping ahead to the SOPs, which we can kind of jump to that next, was mentions that there will be a list of security certifications that an applicant would have to support. We are, uh, we have socialized before, and I'll mention again, that we are looking at high trust as being the first of such certifications. We receive feedback from the Common Agreement Workgroup and from a lot of folks and through um, stakeholder feedback that that was largely supported and that we'll be looking at adding others over time. Uh, we're engaging a, our uh, new RCE Chief Information Security Officer. We'll be able to introduce you to him here shortly. Um, but anyway, so that would be the starting point for that, certainly open to feedback. So back to you, Stephen, if you want to proceed through the SOP section, we can also queue up questions for later. You bet, I will. Um, all right, so now you can go to the next slide. All right, so we're going to talk about a few SOPs today, and we'll move fast. Um, I'm sorry for that. But so let's start with governance. Section uh, three of the Common Agreement talks about governance, and if you've had a chance to read it, you know it's it's pretty dense. Um, and so the it, it, it was really interesting and and challenging in a positive way to work through this with ONC and the rest of the RC team to fashion a governance process that was uh, flexible enough to go from today you know, into the future. And so we decided to do that a, a couple of ways, um, to do it in steps or phases, if you will. And so um, looking at this slide, I wanna we have a transitional council that's the middle cell of this slide the transitional council will will be a 12 month um interim governing body that will begin once the rce designates um a a first set of few hands um and that we hope will be you know, later this year, uh, but that's to be determined. And so, you know, there will be an initial set of humans, and and uh, but at the same time, we know that others will be applying, and we know that the first set absolutely is not the last set. And so, we wanted to be able to create a a nimble um, governance model to to help the RCE. Uh, properly stand up the uh, the TEFCA in its very early days, and but then know that that was temporary. Um, and so we came up with the transitional council. I'm going to unpack that in a future slide today. Um, and so this is based on the assumption that we'll have some number um, of organizations that are early adopters that are not necessarily that they are the first to apply, um, but that uh, because some people may jump in and, as an application, but they may not they may not be designated. They may not qualify to be a human. So there'll be a first set of designated humans at some point. And once we have those, then we will stand up the transitional council for 12 months. And that transitional council will have a really unique uh, job because they will be um, first impression and they'll be working hand in hand with RCE. I think working really, really hard to, to get things uh, going. And then part of that will be, as I'll talk about in a minute, transitioning governance over to the governing council, the, the permanent governing council. 
Um, and so that's all I'm going to say right now, because uh, we have some slides on detail. In addition to, the, to that body, the Governing Council body, transitional permanent, the RC will also establish advisory groups. Um, the, the Sequoia understands how complicated this ecosystem is. And uh, based on the fact that it has stood up and successfully operated uh, high volume, high performing complex networks uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. And so the idea, you know, no one knows everything. And therefore, this idea of advisory groups that's baked into the common agreement and into the SOPs because it's so important. So the Governing Council will have the ability to create advisory groups for a whole bunch of purposes. And some of these are listed here, um, advising on possible amendments to the common agreement. We have version one. I promise you there'll be a version two, maybe a version three. Um, I don't know when that will happen, but this is a dynamic space. It will change. And the common agreement will change um, to reflect that. Um, certainly, amendments to the QTF, amendments to the current SOPs, new SOPs. Um, and so there may be advisory groups that are stood up for those purposes. There may be advisory groups that are stood up. Marianne was just talking about um, healthcare operations and payment, which are exchange purposes. There might be advisory groups stood up about those to drill down into the um, important um, nuances, I suppose, of those purposes. Um, and so this, these are only examples, but the, the concept of advisory groups is very powerful because it allows the RCE and the Governing Council to tap into the wealth of knowledge and experience that is out there in, in the industry. And, um, and so we've, we've um, memorialized that approach in the common agreement and the SOPs. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thanks. All right, so a little bit more on governing approach. So it was important to ONC and certainly to us at the RCE that, that governance be representative. Um, what do we mean by that? Well, we simply mean that those who are governed um, have the opportunity to participate. They have a meaningful role in governance. And therefore, uh, QHENs, participants, and sub-participants must have the opportunity to engage in the governance process um, that we've created under the Common Agreement. So I mentioned the Governing Council, and you can read the very broad list of authority that the Governing Council has. Authority might be the wrong word. The Governing Council works with the RCE. Um, it helps the RCE evaluate um, things. It helps the RCE. Uh, it's a sounding board to the RCE. It's, it, it's an ambassador for the RCE. It's a deep pool of expertise for the RCE. Um, and so, and in fact, the RCE has a seat on the Governing Council. And so we've enumerated the things that the Governing Council will um, work on, and that would include amendments to all the artifacts, being a resource to socialize ideas, help solve problems, uh, and very importantly, have a major role in the dispute resolution process so that when there are disputes, and there will be, um, that those are resolved in an orderly, fair, equitable manner um, so that it doesn't bog down the TEFCA. Now, what you see off to the side here in the graphic, um, how, do we, how do we get to the Governing Council? Well, so we've created two things called caucuses, probably a term that's familiar to you. Um, certainly, if you do any legislative work, uh, caucuses are 
Uh, that's a corner of the realm. And so every shoe-hen uh, that's designated will appoint a representative to the shoe-hen caucus. Um, and, and then every shoe-hen that is designated will appoint three representatives um, to the participant, sub-participant caucuses, and those individuals will be drawn from the shoe hens, participants, and sub-participants. So a shoe hen, maybe they have five participants, uh, and those participants among them have uh, 50 sub-participants. The shoe hen, working with its participants and sub-participants, will identify three individuals that will sit on the participant sub-participant caucus, along with three from every other shoe hen. And you may be saying to yourself, wow, if there's 100 shoe hens, that's 300 people in the caucus. Well, I'm not sure there will be 100 shoe hens, but you're right. And that's OK. Um, representative representative governance is so important that we're not afraid of a large caucus uh the caucus will organize itself figure out how to do business whether it's 10 50 100 or more and uh the human caucus then will be will reflect you know the number of individuals um you know up to uh, however many humans there are now then those caucuses will appoint members to the governing council. The Q-Hen caucus will appoint up to 10, and the participant sub-participant caucus will appoint up to 10. And so you'll have a 21-person governing council, 10 from the Q-Hen side, 10 from the participant sub-participant side, and then the RCE makes 21. And so if there are now, if there are five shoe hens a year from now or a year and a half from now, then there'll only be five um, um, shoe hen representatives on the governing council. And, um, and then there'll be a corresponding number of five drawn from the participant sub-participant caucus. But we can go up to 10. If there are 40 shoe hens, there's still just 10 shoe hen representatives. We're, we're capping the governing council at 21. That's pushing the limits of an effective board uh, based on academic papers and studies. Um, and that may be a little bit too much detail, but uh, I, I, and you'll see all this in the common agreement and in the SOP. I've already talked about their transitional council serving for a year. It's going to take time to get all this set up. As we are onboarding new shoe hens, uh, you know, we, the, the transitional council needs to develop a, a transitional plan so that 12 months plus one day, the governing council is seated, ready to take the reins. And that's going to take a lot of work. Um, and of course, ONC, through the cooperative agreement, oversees you know, all of this. And, um, and the RC is certainly under the authority of ONC and has specific obligations uh, to involve ONC and to uh, be accountable to ONC under the cooperative agreement that the ONC and, and uh, Sequoia, the RC have signed. Next slide. Thank you. All right, so enough about governance. I could talk about it all day. Um, so what about conflicts of interest? Whenever you have bodies like governing council, transitional council, advisory groups, you have the potential for conflicts of interest. So it's, it's really important that the RCE have a process to make sure that every individual that serves in any capacity uh, transitional council, governing council, advisory group, cybersecurity council, 
anything else that that they are that they will act in the best interest of their the hat they're wearing under the common agreement um and we also know through experience that every one of these individuals has a full-time job um somewhere else and uh, and so and this is not unique to the tefka i mean this is something probably everyone on this call is familiar with and so we wanted to address this in an sop not because it's rocket science but to be sure that we signaled how important this is to the rce and to onc and so pretty straightforward really every individual who is um um seeking to or is serving in any capacity whether it's your governing council transitional council advisory group cybersecurity council some other yet to be named um entity they have an affirmative obligation to disclose to the appropriate chairperson or persons of their of their body um of their uh deliver we call them deliberative bodies because they don't they're not really decisional bodies in every case so they are deliberative bodies to disclose to the chairperson or persons hey i have um either an actual conflict or a potential conflict on a question that is before my deliberative body um Maybe it's something that involves your competitor. It's something that involves your own organization or, or something else. Um, and we define in the SOP what an actual conflict is and what a potential conflict is. And we go the extra mile of requiring disclosure of potential conflicts. Often that's not required, but we think it's really important so that the leadership knows that I have a potential conflict um, with with a particular matter. Now, if I have an actual conflict, uh, then I'm required to recuse myself, term of art, to step aside um, from any any discussion of a matter that involves the conflict of interest that either I've identified or someone else has identified for me. Now, notice this says any discussion. For those of you that are lawyers or other folks dialed into state law, um, corporate law for um, boards, very often state law will allow a conflicted director to participate in the debate, but not vote we've set a higher bar we're saying a conflicted member cannot even participate in the discussion because we do not want to taint taint the discussion with any potential um conflict of interest now if if i identify a potential conflict and again the criteria are set out in the sop then we deal with that in a case-by-case -case basis and decide you know, whether I'm refused or not. And then this is all reported to the deliberative body. It's very transparent. And if another member of the body isn't happy, let's say that the leadership says, well, um, you don't have an actual conflict of interest, but others on the, on the deliberative body think I do, they can appeal that. They can appeal that. Um, and that's all set out in the SOP. Okay, next slide. Dispute resolution. Um, talk about how important this is. I mean, there are disputes and there will be. We want to try to get those resolved at the lowest level possible um, so that they don't blow up into, um, into litigation that's in court. Um, I'm a lawyer, I've done litigation, it has its place. Um, but it can also be very expensive, very disruptive, and very unsatisfactory. So the DR process is written in a way to 
really very affirmatively tried to promote resolution without folks having to resort to litigation. Um, it starts with an informal conference among the agreed parties. It then can go to a independent dispute resolution council. Disputes are very broadly defined. Um, and then at the end of the day, everything can be appealed to the governing council. Now, this does not prevent anyone from ultimately going to court. Um, we can't really do that. And so, but we do hope that we can promote resolution short of that. Okay, next slide. I know I'm coming up on the end of my 20 minutes for this module. All right, security. Um, the right hand box is simply reminding everyone that healthcare and public health are part of the nation's critical infrastructure when it comes to responding to um, natural disasters, man-made disasters, attacks, um, and um, pandemics. Um, we are all part of the national critical infrastructure because we're in healthcare. And therefore, the security of the network, as well as the information transacted over the network, is vital for national security. So the security SOP talks about the requirements that the QHINs must follow. Marianne touched on this. This will really be fleshed out by the Cybersecurity Council, led by Jonathan, uh, once he's on board. And But some of the highlights are listed here um, about third-party certification, annual audits, um, comprehensive documentation requirements, treating information about security as confidential, and of course the council that QNs will be required to appoint someone to sit on that. Um, we'll be talking about a lot of that. Um, a lot of that going forward. All right, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Um, all right, so now really quickly on cybersecurity insurance coverage. Every QN uh, is required to um, have a way to cover their liability under um, under the common agreement. And you remember that liability, there's liability limit of up to two million per occurrence and five million aggregate. Now there are multiple ways to do this for cyber security. You can have a policy of insurance. Um, and coverage with coverage that is no less than the liability limits, or you can self-insure through internal financial reserves, or you can do some combination. And so what this SOP talks about is how do you demonstrate you're in compliance? Well, that might be providing um, a, uh, an insurance certificate for your coverage, uh, it might be showing us your internal reserves so that we can see on audited financials that you had sufficient reserves. It might be both. As a QN, as part of your application, you must attest to your compliance with this requirement. And you must also notify the RCE if anything changes at, at any point. All right, next slide, please. This is my last one. This is simply for the lawyers in the room. The common agreement talks about order of precedence because we know the common agreement will have to be interpreted in the future. And so there has to be a pecking order because there's a there are a lot of moving parts here. And so the pecking order 
is simply applicable law controls in every case. Um, if applicable law is silent, then the common agreement, um, including the required flowdowns. After that, the QTF. After that, the dispute resolution process. Um, after that, all other SOPs. Below the SOPs, there might be other documents, attachments, exhibits, artifacts, um, other things that are incorporated into the common agreement. And then below that, there could be a, um, a large body of informative guidance materials or other things. Now, you might never get down to Romanet 6 or Romanet 7, um, but this is the comprehensive pecking order. Now, when we think about information sharing within the TEFCA, any QHAN or participant or sub-participant that discloses data um, must do so in accordance with applicable law. You can never violate applicable law. And any entity requesting data must also comply with applicable law. And that's, that's really the poll star, okay? So with that, I'm going to turn this back over, I believe, to Marianne. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, we're happy to take uh, questions. We've been trying to answer them, you know, as we've been uh, going along. And um, but there is one, you know, around public health and flowdown provisions and to the extent to they apply to public health agencies. So, for instance, public health agencies are not covered entities under HIPAA but they do have state laws and rules they have to follow for security and privacy of their systems. Will that likely suffice for flow down provisions since they can't really, you know, it's not easy to go and change those laws. Do you have a response to that? I'm sorry, was that, was that for me? My apologies. Um, yes, it was. Well, I mean, I understand that you know, changing law is not an easy process, but um, we have to operate in conformance with applicable law because otherwise we have, you know, we sort of have chaos. So, um, I mean, I think that's the only answer I can give at this point. And definitely encourage you all to, to type in your questions. We do see some coming in. So I'll go ahead and, and just kind of run down these as we go. Um, this one is more of, I just wanted to share some of the feedback we've been getting through the, the chat function in terms of the comments, you know, uh, and requests for feedback on, you know, what do you all think about high trust certification? So got some support for that and another suggestion to look at others as well, like ENAX privacy and security accreditation. So we're looking at that as well, for sure. Um, so so here is a question around the applicability of, uh, of consent. So this is a scenario, and I'll ask the team if you want to copy and paste this into the chat function, that would be great. So does QHIN B have an obligation to share PHI with QHIN A for a patient, even if, the pa even if the patient has not consented to the data being shared for some, but not all of the exchange purposes that TEFCA allows? Well, I'll start. I mean, if the patient if the patient hasn't consented to having their information shared, um, then um, th then the covered entity or business associate that has that information doesn't have the authority to share it, um, and so therefore. Um, you know that would be that that would be a situation where that um, covered entity or business associate would have to comply with applicable law and and not not disclose that information because the patient prohibited it. So building on that, say the uh, data holder. Um, is not required by law to obtain an individual's consent to release for purposes, say, outside of treatment, but they opt to do so as a matter of policy for purposes outside of treatment. We actually hear this a lot, you know, from um, 
some health information networks, for instance, that their network was structured around only supporting treatment-based exchange, and that they may have to go back and, you know, really work with their respective community of data holders to get permission, but even though it's not restricted by law, it's all a matter of policy and contract. How does TEFCA, you know, really operate in that environment where it, it's not dr driven by law, but by policy or contract? Well, um, yeah, that's a really complicated question, but I mean, the, we say by, by contract or by policy. So, you know, it, it should be, I mean, if I'm a business associate of a covered entity, my business associate agreement will certainly tell me what I'm permitted to do with the EPHI that, that I hold on behalf of my covered entity customer. And HIPAA says I have to follow that. So, so that really is, you know, that that that's a legal requirement um, under HIPAA. Um, and so, I think answering that's really beyond the scope of today. We should take a long time talking about it. Um, that's probably a good discussion for a future session. But, um, and and this has come up a lot with information blocking where people say, well, I have a policy that says I'm not going to do X, Y, Z. Well, that policy may now violate the information blocking rule. Um, so policies are not sacred. Policies have to operate within the ecosystem. And so um, now with, with the common agreement, it's, it's a little different because the common agreement's not federal law the way information blocking is. And so I, I think that that's going to have to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis by the shoe hen, by the participant, by the sub-participant um, in deciding, do they respond? How do they respond? Okay. So here's another scenario, and, and thank you all for clarifying this because I, I think I might have missed this nuance. So if a patient uses an individual access service provider, an app that is connected you know, as a sub-participant to a QHIN. Can, do they, does that uh, individual have to respond to treatment queries through their IAS provider? And that may be a question for Alan. I don't know. Well, that that's, uh, I, I guess, do they have to? Well, they, they need to have the, the capability to, but it, with it being the, the patient as the individual uh, holding their own records, uh, that would be determined by whatever the the consent the, the individual has with that individual access service app. The individual has no requirement under applicable law to make their own information available to anyone, uh, but should they want to make their information available to their treating provider, uh, their individual access service app or, or provider should certainly make that capability available to them to be a responder when someone sends a treatment query for that information. Okay, just let me know if there, for folks who pose that if we covered your, your request. Um, there are many third-party certifications and accreditations for security take 12 to 18 months to achieve. Is there a plan to provide a roadmap to compliance since the, these requirements have not been previously disclosed? So we have been talking about um, high trust certification as an example for about a year now. Um, and so we, we do recognize it can take some time. One of the concepts that we've been, um, you know, thinking through, just recognizing that it does take time to go through that and it hasn't been formally, you know, communicated in an SOP per se, is um, could an applicant uh, commit when they submit an application to be a QHIN, um, agree to pursue certification and recognizing they're going to have to get through the onboarding process within 12 months anyway, and that before they're designated as a QHIN, they will have achieved that certification. So that's another example um, of how to kind of meet the market where it is. And so, you know, definitely, of course, we're, you know, super interested and really appreciate you all giving that some thought and this feedback. It's, it's super valuable. Um, let's see. <laughs> this is a comment. It's a kind of funny. Hoping these organizations have looked at the information blocking regulations. I assume that's around the uh, option to or desire to support more than just the treatment exchange purpose. Okay, let's see. Plus one for ENAC accreditation for privacy and security. 
Hey, Marianne, okay. uh, it's John. I was wondering if I could. Hey, John, thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to to just highlight something uh, Steve Gravely mentioned a second ago, so that folks are are really clear about how it works when someone has actively asked that their data not be shared to a provider. That was the last part of what Steve was saying. And so if that's occurred, then it's in that case that, like Steve was saying, that that data, that, um, data wouldn't be able to be disclosed. So I just um, wanted to make sure folks understood that, that particular point. Thank you, John, I appreciate that. And is there anything else, you know, we've been covering a lot of questions here. Anything else that you wanted to comment on? I mean, I should have paused here and asked the ONC team to, to weigh in on anything or correct us if we <laughs> out of sure no um no i think i think that's um you know the, you guys have been doing a great job and the the um you know the the points about information blocking that have been coming up like we want to make sure people understand that that is a a separate uh law or a separate uh, rule from tefka and so in tefka we mention you know applicable law and that so that in, that includes uh the information blocking regulations and so it's pointing to something that's outside of tefka so um, we are limited in things that we can say related to information blocking. And so um, what, that's why it may sound like uh, the uh, responses that we're, we're giving are invasive, et cetera. We wanna point people to that information blocking regulation separately and all of the informational resources related to that. Please do visit lit.gov slash cures rule, all of that information there, including the rule itself. So. Just wanted to emphasize that. Thank you so much, John. All right, here's another interesting scenario. Let's see, how are we doing on time? We only have three minutes, but this is an interesting one. And it's again around consent. It's really important and we are you know, gonna be spending more time on this. So, so if a covered entity receives a, a, a query or request that includes a patient consent, are they honored, are they bound to honor that consent and disclose the information even if the patient has not directly consented to that organization. So right now, um, I'll just address this briefly and then, you know, Steve weigh in, but um, is that authorization-based or consent-based per exchange purposes are not currently in scope for the exchange purposes. is treatment, payment, healthcare operations, none of which require consent, public health, and uh, government benefits determination which presumably would include an authorization and i'm sure i'm missing one individual access services so so those um other consent based approaches would be considered in the future but the only one that i that's clear uh that would be in, in scope for the current set of six exchange purposes would be the government benefits determination in that instance the request the response to that would be yes if you receive an authorization based request from the requester, then you rely on it and release the information, unless you're prohibited by a law to do so. So I know we only have a couple minutes left. I'll try to field just maybe one more. Um, will the RC, ONC, or any entity, or, or any entity help potential participants decide which QHIM will give them the best deal? Well, that is a great question. The RCE really has an objective set of criteria that we'll use to determine whether a network qualifies as a QHIN. We really aren't getting into the business practices, uh, pricing value service of QHINs and evaluating those. It, I assume there will be consultants and others that will evaluate that, but we are really trying uh, to create a, a competitive marketplace and so that the, the bar is equal in terms of what's required to be a QHIN and that they themselves can differentiate their value based on you know, really the service and, and the pricing uh, that they provide. Uh, let's see, many QHINs have already been certified by third parties, so it may not take that long. This that may be only a slight change in certification is necessary. Thank you very much. All right, and let's see, is TEFCA leading to policy regulation change after the Cures Act of 2016? We don't know. Uh, I don't know that anything interoperability related is in Cures uh, after in this next round of Cures. Um, well, actually, I'm going to pause there and leave tee that up for John. I think I just <laughs> jumped way ahead of something that was not what the question was asking. Uh, we're really, you know, we're just following ONC's policy direction. But John, anything you want to comment on that? I'm really sorry, Mary. Could you say it again? It was, is TEFCA leading to policy or regulatory changes beyond what we're doing here? Thank you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, uh, 
uh, we did tweet out something that we want to be really clear on. Tefka is not a rule. Um, people uh, have um, asked us that, or you know, sometimes that sort of might be surmised from from you know how uh, how big of a thing it is, uh, you know, because big rules are big things. But it, but it is very it is different, uh, and so we want to make sure that that people are are clear there. There there are separate uh, other rules that HHS uh, promulgates and um, you know that those are separate from TEPCA. However, as per uh, the 21st Century Cures Act, they uh, could leverage TEPCA as a standard for you know requiring for exchange, et cetera. So um, that's um, that's the way to think about it. Great. Well, I think we're up on time. Uh, fantastic questions. Really thankful that you joined us today. We have some exciting uh, updates to share. Um, one is that we are working with the ONC team to host uh, office hours. Um, we're going to propose one focused on common agreement issues, another on QTF issues. We'll tee up any questions we weren't able to address through these webinars, tee that up. So we're realizing folks have a lot of questions, so we don't want to communicate less. We want to communicate more. We're also contemplating workshops where for candidate QHINs that really need to delve into the details, we really can't do justice to some of the more detailed quest, fine-tuned questions in this type of forum. So we're thinking like a multi-hour workshop where we do a super deep dive. So those are some concepts we're thinking about. If you all do think of anything um, in the meantime, don't hesitate to email us at rce at sequoiaproject.org. And Don, I'll ask you uh, real quick, I know we're over two minutes, sorry everybody, um, in terms of the next webinar. Um, our next planned webinar is our monthly call. Uh, and as always, which is the third Tuesday uh, of February, off the top of my head, I don't know what that is. Uh, and then as always, all past events, including today's, we've had lots of questions. Today's slides are already on the website and we'll have today's recording posted no later than tomorrow. Fantastic, all right. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of the afternoon and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks everybody.